Welcome back to Sundays at Coastal for the week of Sunday, February 26th, 2023. This week, Pastor Paul preaches a sermon titled Unhindered, and it's from the book of Acts, chapter 28, verses 14 through 31. Pastor Paul finishes the book of Acts, last sermon in the series, by following the Apostle Paul's journey. The Apostle Paul reaches Italy and has a chance to do ministry there in many different ways by meeting with the new Christians in Rome, by preaching the gospel while he's on trial, even by living on his own while under guard. The book of Acts ends with the word, unhindered. Thank you, Joe. Oh, So, oh, John Hubbard, would you stand? John. If you, by the way, look at the shirt John's wearing. That's what Alpha's all about, love listens. And if you have a friend, a skeptical friend, a friend who's maybe spiritually homeless, a friend who's drifted, and they're looking for a safe place to re-explore, uh, come out and sign up at the table right out here with John. He'll be out there, uh, ask John any questions. It's an amazing experience. This will be my 40th Alpha this spring. <laughs> 40 is a beautiful number. So I want to welcome you all to, uh, to this gathering today. If you're new, uh, I just have to say this is a pretty amazing church. I know I'm supposed to say that, but we have three beliefs, and they're all centered in Jesus. We believe that Jesus gives us in our world hope beyond our brokenness. And we believe that the risen Jesus is worth all of our trust. Like he can bear the weight of your whole identity, your whole life. And as you learn to trust him, he will always push you out towards those in need, just as he pushed Walter out towards Corny? Uh, Cornelius, I love that name. And uh, the Lord constantly pushes us out into places of brokenness in our world. And these core beliefs lead to three core choices. And these are not just one thing I did 20 years ago when I accepted Christ, but it's an everyday choosing again and again and again. And so can you, sh can you recite with me uh, what we believe about being a disciple? A disciple is one choosing to be changed by Jesus, choosing to seek Jesus first, and choosing to join Jesus. Due to the devastating earthquakes in Syria and Turkey, hundreds of thousands of people in Syria and Turkey are sleeping in the open in often sub-zero temperature right now. We have a connection with a body of Turkish believers who are on the ground helping with the relief effort. Their pastor has been a dear friend of mine for 20 years. His name is Ramazan Arkan, and he is there now. On Monday evening, our elders voted to immediately send his church $5,000 to help. The elders also approved taking an offering for a second gift to be sent on March 1st, and they committed to match that gift up to $5,000 more. If you're doing the numbers, there's a potentiality that we can contribute at least $15,000 to assist in the relief work and help the Turkish church have a chance to shine for Jesus in the midst of this crisis. And so you can give online. There's the information on how to give. We invite you to be who you are. You're an amazingly generous congregation. Can we pray right now? Oh, Father, there's such a need for shelter, for fuel, for health care, for clean water, especially for the very young and the very aged. Lord, we pray for critically needed strength for the relief workers. And most of all, we pray for hope in this part of the world that's been devastated by a displaced war, 
and in so much brokenness. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that the little community of Jesus followers would shine brightly in this crisis, in that part of the world, and we give you uh, this, this time right now, Jesus. We ask that your kingdom would come right now in this room as it is in heaven. Everybody breathe deeply and welcome the Holy Spirit into your body, into your mind, into your imagination. Come Holy Spirit. Can you say that with me? Come Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. For much of the past year, we have been on a journey through the story of the early church in the book of Acts, and today is our finale. So, hold on to your seats. <laughs> I wanted to start with a quick flyover of this epic story that we've been covering for a year. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm a very much a visual learner, if you haven't learned that already. So I'm using imagery designed by the creative artists at Bible Project for our flyover. The book of Acts is actually part two of a two-volume set written by Dr. Luke. The first volume is the Gospel of Luke, covering the things that Jesus began to do and teach, he said. The implication is that Acts, volume two, is about what the risen Lord continues to do and teach through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Acts, say hi. <laughs> Welcome the Holy Spirit. Acts opens with the risen Jesus meeting for 40 days with his followers teaching about the kingdom of God and declaring, y'all will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But Jesus said, don't go on this mission in your own power. Wait for the gift of my Father, the promised Holy Spirit. And so, like so many revivals, Acts begins with an extended prayer meeting. The small band of Jesus' followers waited on God. And on the great Jewish feast of Pentecost, the Spirit came. Now, what's Pentecost? Well, with a mighty hand, the Lord liberated his people from slavery in Egypt. Way back in the book of Exodus, we read about it. And he led them on a 50 penta day journey to Mount Sinai, where they were given two gifts the covenant and the tabernacle, the covenant being the Ten Commandments and the tabernacle being the mobile worship sanctuary. Yahweh, their savior, came down from the mountain into the very center of his people in this mobile worship tent, and they experienced his glorious holy presence throughout their wilderness wanderings. Fast forward to the second chapter of Acts the same glorious presence of God descended again as the disciples prayed, this time not in a tent or a physical temple, but in a living temple, a community of Jesus' followers. Isn't that cool? Look around and tell someone you're the new temple. <laughs> yeah. For some of us, that can be scary. <laughs> And this community included Jews from throughout the Roman Empire, from Africa, Egypt, Arabia, modern-day Iraq, Turkey, even as far as the city of Rome, the capital of the empire. This is amazing. The newborn church from the very beginning was a diverse, multi-ethnic community, all united by their common allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ and their common experience of his glorious power in the Holy Spirit. And like the Israelites at Sinai, the Spirit takes this new community on a journey. These new disciples can't keep the good news of Jesus to themselves. They're moved by the Holy Spirit to bring it not just to people of Israel, but to pagan Gentiles. Paul and his team are sent by the Spirit in the church in Antioch, which is modern Antakya, which was absolutely devastated by the earthquake, by the way. On multiple road trips where they proclaimed the good news across modern-day Turkey and Greece, everywhere they went, they proclaimed the news that the risen Jesus is not only the 
liberating Lord of Israel. He is the true king of the nations. And just about everywhere they went, they got in trouble. They faced opposition, in many cases, violence and imprisonment. Paul and his team were driven out about just about every town they visited. British theologian N.T. Wright puts it this way, everywhere Paul went, there was a riot. Everywhere I go, people serve tea. <laughs> but along the way, many responded in repentance and faith. Both Jews and Gentiles gave their allegiance to Jesus and formed these new house churches, these communities called ecclesias. Can you say that with me? Ecclesias, uh, which really means called out ones, the, the word for church, became little embassies of the kingdom of God across the empire of Rome. These bands of Jesus followers experienced a clash of cultures as they lived out their everyday lives with Jesus and with one another. The whole Roman culture, economics, politics, military, art, and even leisure, was held together by the worship of a pantheon of gods. Caesar himself was proclaimed Lord and Savior. The early Christians had the audacity to declare that the risen Jesus was not just another god in the pantheon. He was the liberating Lord of all. Amen? Amen. The church didn't only meet resistance from the pagan Roman culture. Leaders of the Jewish communities throughout the empire often viewed this gospel as a threat. In an effort to grow trust, and unity between the Jewish and Gentile communities, Paul collected funds from the majority Gentile churches all over the empire on behalf of the poor Jewish communities in Jerusalem. It was like a grand change for a dollar offering. <laughs> His plan was to deliver this gift to the leaders of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Along the way, many of Paul's friends warned him not to go back to Jerusalem, literally fearing for his safety. But Paul would not be deterred. And sure enough, instead of reconciliation, Paul experienced in Jerusalem chaos and riots. His gospel, especially the part about welcoming non-Jewish Gentiles into God's covenant family, was seen as heresy. A crowd seized and beat Paul. To save his life, the Roman authorities had to arrest him. And for two years, he was passed from one ruler to another, making his defense. Finally, Paul appeals this case to Caesar himself, and the Roman governor goes, whew, to Caesar you go, because we don't know what to do with this Paul. But Paul had no pity party in prison. He made the most of his time, urgently writing the various new churches across the empire, letters we have in our New Testament today, like Colossians and Ephesians and Philippians. This is so like our Lord Jesus. He turns our confinements into assignments. Amen? You and I may feel stuck, sidelined, or confined by our circumstances, but the good news, friends, is that Jesus can't be chained. And his restoration work can't be changed. And so the prisoner Paul is loaded onto a grain ship bound for, for Rome. The journey is quite an adventure. Paul and the crew experience a terrifying storm. Everyone but Paul fe feared for their lives. They're eventually shipwrecked on a small Mediterranean island called Malta. The journey included a whole series of, as Andy said, are you serious, Lord, moments. If I had been Paul, I would have resigned from the mission multiple times, say, Lord, send someone else. Yet his Roman escorts finally arrived at an Italian port near Naples, and that's where we pick up the story in Acts 28. Friends, we just covered 27 chapters in seven minutes. Because I wanted to bring you into the story. In verse 14, there at Port Puteoli, we found some brethren and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And thus we came to Rome. And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there as far as the market Appius and the three inns to meet us. Can you read this with me? And when Paul saw them, 
I love this. When Paul first met the Italian believers, he saw them and he, Eucharist, that's the Greek word for, he, th- he, he gave thanks and he took courage. After so many, are you serious, Lord, moments, Paul found his refuge in the body of Christ. And this is my experience with y'all, right here. As we gather each Sunday and greet one another and worship and sing the gospel over each other and share restoration stories like we heard from Walter and hear the word and celebrate communion, my are you serious moments are transformed into gratitude and courage because of y'all. And I think, uh, I keep hearing that you're experiencing that too. I thank you for being my refuge in the storms of my life. How many of you have found this church to be a refuge in the storms of your life? Thank you, Jesus. We need each other. And Paul, after that storm and that trip, when he saw his belie- the believing family, he said, I got a refuge here. And so, Paul finally arrives at his destination, the very hub of one of the greatest civilizations in human history, the Roman Empire, extending from the Atlantic Ocean in the west to the Persian, the Red Sea in the east. The empire was built on administrative, technological, architectural genius and military brutality as it conquered nations and absorbed their customs and commerce into its orbit of increasing domination. By Paul's time, the capital city of Rome had reached nearly a million inhabitants, approximately one in four of which were slaves. Rome is known for its Colosseum, its Forum, its Pantheon, its temples, its theaters, its baths, its brothels, its villas, its apartment blocks. And guess who was the emperor at this time? the tyrannical, self-indulgent, debauched Nero. This is the Rome that Paul entered. Are you guys with me? Dr. Luke continues, can you read? When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who was guarding him. After three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. Paul's placed under house arrest, chained to a soldier. Imagine that, being chained to Paul. That gives new meaning to the word captive audience. (laughs) I'm not sure who was the captive audience there. He is given freedom to have guests, so he makes the most of it. Note Paul's first priority, opening his prison apartment to leaders of the non-Christian Jewish community in Rome. Of all the people he could meet with in Rome, Why does he meet with this group? I believe the answer is in a word, respect. You know the song, (laughs) R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Paul wants to honor his roots, the roots of the gospel story. You cannot understand Jesus, friends, apart from the story of the Hebrew scriptures. Remember, the Old Testament was the first Bible of the early church, friends. They were deeply shaped by the story of creation, exodus, Torah, tabernacle, wilderness, promised land, temple, kings, prophets, exile, and promise. This is our story, too. Everywhere he went, Paul sought to connect the dots between this grand story and the story of Jesus and to create a radically new kind of community built around the Messiah a new kind of king who is bringing reconciliation between Jew and Gentile rich and poor, slave and free, male and female, the world had never known such a community. And I believe our world is longing to see it like never before in my lifetime. Paul was convinced that this radical unity is the basis for God's mission in the world. Without this unity, we don't have a mission. Amen? Finally, I believe Paul first met with the Jewish leaders in the capital to give them the first offer of the good news, the first opportunity to hear and respond. And so Paul starts by telling the story of how and why he was brought to Rome. In verse 
verse 17, and when they came together, he began saying to them, can you read with me? Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Verse 18, and when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. Verse 20, for this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. He held up his chains, and the guard is chained to him, and says, why am I wearing these? for the sake of the hope of Israel. That hope is what the Hebrew prophets pointed to longingly. When their God would come to liberate his people from sin and injustice and slavery and death. How? By taking it all into himself in his life, death, and resurrection. When Paul says, I am wearing these chains for the hope of Israel, he means I'm wearing these chains for the sake of Jesus. Jesus is not only the hope of Israel, he's the hope of the whole world, amen? And they responded, we've never received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have, there must have been some problem with their email system because the word was out <laughs> all over the empire, but nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we do to desire to hear from you what your views are for concerning this sect uh, the, the, the Greek word is heresy. It is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. Again, wherever the gospel has been shared, it faced a mixed reception. Some accepted it and others actively resisted it. Can you read verse 23 with me? When they set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers and he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses, from the prophets, from morning till evening. And so another gathering takes place with many more in attendance. I can't figure out how they all fit in Paul's little prison apartment. But again, Paul makes the most of the opportunity from morning till evening, he solemnly testifies and teaches, again, connecting the dots between the law, the prophets, the kingdom of God, and the Messiah, Jesus. I'm sure the Roman believers catered in Jersey Mike's or Fatty's Pizza. It had to be Italian, of course, right? The gathering likely include lively, honest, thoughtful discussion. It's like Paul hosted an all-day alpha course in downtown Rome. Verse 24, some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. I love the, the Greek tense for being convinced. It's, it's an active, continuous. It's not a one and done. Uh, it communicates to me that conversion is a journey, and we need space. Others resisted. Literally, the Greek is refused to believe. To the resistors, Paul has a word. Quoting from the 7th century BC prophet, Isaiah. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. Quote, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke about y'all through Isaiah the prophet, saying, can you read it with me? Go to this people and say, you will keep on hearing but will not understand and you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Paul is quoting from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6. Here's the context. Isaiah is worshiping in the temple. He sees the Lord high and lifted up. He hears angelic warriors singing like we did today, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And Isaiah's response is, it's all over. I'm doomed. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of filthy lips. 
Then one of the angelic warriors took a coal from the altar of the temple and flew over and touched the prophet's list, lips. Can you just imagine that? <laughs> and he heard the word, now your guilt is removed and your sin is forgiven. Immediately, Isaiah heard another voice saying, whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? His response was, here I am, send me. The voice says, go to this people and say, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand, and you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive, for your hearts have become dull. What a tough job for the prophet. Basically, you will go, but your message and your mission will be resisted at every point. Why? Because their hearts had become calloused. I want to heal them and restore them, but they refuse to trust me. In a nutshell, this is the message of the Lord to the people of Israel and Isaiah. Turn from your self-salvation projects and trust me. I will send a servant king who will bear your sin and lead you into a new exodus of freedom, restoration, righteousness, justice, and shalom. Some repented, but many resisted. So it was, as Paul met with the Jewish folks in Rome. Some repented, many resisted. Friends, I, have, I believe personal and social transformation only begins when you and I come to the end of ourselves. What is step one of the 12 steps? I have come to know my life is unmanageable and my self-salvation projects are not working. Healing begins when we give up our self-salvation projects and put our full trust in his liberating king, Jesus. So please be careful, friends. Don't let your heart get calloused. It doesn't happen overnight. It's like the frog in the kettle. When we hear God's word but choose not to marinate in it, or to not put it into practice, we build a another callus. And we keep doing that. As we keep doing that, our hearts become like stone. And before we know it, we've become deaf and blind to the voice and to the work of God. Friends, don't let your heart get calloused. When you hear the word, let it enter into your life, because if you don't, it, it, the effect is callousness. That's why we do heart work in every small group we do here, and celebrate recovery, and alpha, and DNA groups, and table talk, and home groups, and prayer retreats. Is we, the, the goal is to keep our hearts tender, to not let them get calloused. And when I isolate, my heart gets callous. And so I really encourage you, lean in with your heart. Amen? Verse 28, read it with me. Paul says, Therefore, let it be known to y'all that this salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. When he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. The audience actually got into a dispute over Paul's message. That's interesting. And he stayed full two years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say it with me? With all unhindered. And that's the end of the book of Acts. The last word. The last word in the whole story is unhindered. Is that cool? Author Luke brings us full circle back to how the story began in chapter 1 where we saw the risen Jesus spending 40 days telling his disciples about the kingdom of God. As concludes with prisoner Paul spending two years telling anyone who would listen about the kingdom of God. Friends, the good news of the kingdom of God is the theme of the whole story. Both volume 1, the gospel and Jesus' ministry, and volume 2, what Jesus did through his church and the spirit. The kingdom of God is near, not merely about going to heaven after we die, friends. It's welcoming the rule of heaven on earth, here and now. It's welcoming God's rule in the mess of our present world. 
The promises made to Abraham way back in Genesis are being fulfilled. Israel's God and the Messiah Jesus has claimed his throne as the liberating Lord of the nations, the world's true king, and in him alone the world is being restored. Can I have an amen? amen. I love how Eugene Peterson renders the closing words of the book of Acts. He said, Paul lived for two years in his rented house. He welcomed everyone who came to visit. He urgently presented all matters of the kingdom of God. He explained everything about Jesus Christ. His door was always open. It's the last words of Acts. His door was always open. Now, some scholars see this as a rather abrupt ending. Why doesn't Luke wrap a bow on the story by telling us what happened to Paul? In his trial before Nero, is he vindicated or is he condemned? Does he live or is he executed? The story simply ends with Paul freely and boldly proclaiming King Jesus right under Nero's nose. I believe Luke's abrupt ending is intentional. Why? Because we as the readers are being invited to pick up the story. To take up our part in the unfinished drama. To play our role in the continuing mission of Jesus. Right here in our communities, neighborhoods, families, schools, and workplaces. Right here. But I need to give you a reality check. The Christian life is not a cakewalk. Proclaiming Jesus and loving the world involves suffering. Wherever Paul went, there was a riot. Yet he kept following the Holy Spirit right into the face of opposition. Paul returned to Jerusalem against advice, was seized by the crowd, arrested, falsely accused, tortured, tried before secular and religious rulers, sent to Rome, blessed and broke bread in the middle of the storm. According to tradition, just four years after the end of the book of Acts, A.D. 64, Paul was condemned by Nero and executed. Likewise, our Lord returned to Jerusalem against the advice of his friends, blessed and broke bread in the middle of his storm, was seized by the crowd, arrested, falsely accused, tortured, tried before secular and religious leaders, declared by the Roman governor to be innocent, yet condemned to execution by crucifixion. Do you see a pattern here? The way of Paul, the way of the church, is the way of Jesus. The kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom where God's rule is extended not through domination, but through suffering love. Throughout history, the mission of the church has advanced through the blood of the martyrs. The kingdom of Jesus is a strange kind of rule. He has chosen to bring his liberating authority into the world through those of us who are broken, who are meek, who hunger, who mourn, who pursue peace, and who are persecuted for righteousness. Those are the people Jesus wants to use to bring his kingdom. It's a strange kind of kingdom. Yet this Jesus, after being enthroned on a cross, was raised to life and exalted as Messiah and Lord. And he has given us, friends, everything we need to carry this story forward. We've, we've got the same Holy Spirit that we see in the book of Acts. Amen? Amen? The same Spirit who is filling disciples today, giving us courage and boldness today, healing the broken and delivering the oppressed today, moving across cultural barriers and prejudices today, performing signs and wonders today, forming new communities of radical generosity and joy today. Amen? Empowering, equipping, and guiding us in our mission today. Jesus promises to us, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my martyrs. That's the Greek word for witnesses. Across the table, across the street, across the tracks, to the very end of the earth. Jesus continues today to build little embassies of the kingdom of God right here under the nose of our secular empire here in beautiful central California. During my time serving as an associate pastor in Ventura, our church cultivated a partnership with a small body of believers in post-communist Albania. Their whole nation was in recovery 
from decades of a brutal animal farm type dictatorship. It was one of the last communist countries to open to the West. I had the opportunity to spend a couple of months in Albania nurturing our church's partnership. It was quite a cross-cultural learning time for me to see a culture, economy, infrastructure completely devastated. Basic services like electricity, water, health care, or legal representation were not consistently available. Communist corruption had been replaced by capitalist corruption. And of course, I didn't speak the language. I was culturally clueless most of the time, having to lean heavily on my Albanian hosts for everyday practicalities, like a fish out of water. And then a wonderful surprise came our way. We learned that somehow our U.S. team had been invited to celebrate the 4th of July at the U.S. Embassy, right there in the capital of Tirana. And the special day came, and together with our Albanian hosts, we passed through security checkpoints and were escorted onto the U.S. Embassy compound into what I can only describe as a slice of middle America, right there in the middle of post-communist <laughs> Albania, <laughs> including green lawns, a grand southern-style ambassador mansion, barbecued hot dogs, I've been missing American hot dogs, burgers and beans, even a 70s rock and roll cover band. In a moment, suddenly, our Albanian hosts became the clueless guests who needed us to explain all these cultural <laughs> symbols. Like, why do they do that? What, what, what's that about? Why do you eat that? It was surreal, friends. In a moment, we went from being guests in foreign Albania to hosts in this little slice of middle America. And this is what the church is, an embassy of the kingdom of God, not a slice of America but a slice of the kingdom of God right here in the middle of a broken secular empire. Friends, the church is designed to be a little embassy of heaven's rule where we joyfully celebrate the freedom of God. What a privilege to serve as hosts in this, better yet, ambassadors in this little kingdom embassy called Coastal Community Church. Is that cool? <laughs> Holy Spirit, we are so humble that you've chosen to make us an embassy of heaven here in the five cities. We're amazed that that we get to be the ambassadors of this good news that the crucified servant has become the Lord of the nations and he brings freedom, true freedom to the whole world. And he also brings reconciliation and he creates new community that this world cannot fabricate, Lord. And we thank you for this body that we get to be your embassy here. And so we just wanna say, come Holy Spirit, you shall receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my martyrs. You will be my witnesses. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Can you say that with me? Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us as your ambassadors. Right where we live, in our families, our neighborhoods, our workplace, our friend groups, how we relate to people who are different than ourselves. Lord, come, Holy Spirit. Fill us. And this book of Acts, let us be the next chapter. Chapter 29. Let it happen here. Let us worship, friends. Clapping again. Yes. Great is your.
your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You never change. You never fail, oh God. True are your promises. True are your promises. You never change. You never fail, oh God. So we raise up holy hands. Pray. is to come so we raise up holy hands praise the holy one who was and is and is to come wide is your love and grace Wide is your love and grace. You never change. You never fail, oh God. Okay, y'all sing it. Wide is your love. Deacon Lori and I will be up. We would be honored to stand with you in prayer as you need a piece of heaven to break into a part of your life that's broken. We'd be honored to stand with you. Um, also, if you're looking for a place, amazing people, amazing friends to unpack this sermon and do some heart work, that's what we do at Table Talk across the street. The house with the picket fence has a patio and we meet there every Sunday at 1040. And finally, talk to my friend back there with the shirt that says, Love Listens. Do you know somebody in your world that needs to be listened into faith? Invite him to Alpha next Monday night, I'm sorry, Wednesday night, the 1st of uh, March. 
uh, and just explore. May the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen? Amen. Have a great day. Pastor Paul Dugan is the pastor of Mission and Discipleship at Coastal Community Church. It's located in Grover Beach, California and serves communities across the Central Coast. Join us online each week on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our weekly live stream. We also have two in-person services at 9 a.m. and 1040 a.m. in our sanctuary. Coastal Community Church is located at 1830 Farrell Road, Grover Beach, California. For more information, visit our website, www.mycoastal.org. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.